Hi, everybody. Uh, Nikolai Kazanov. I am a bioinformatics scientist at uh, Compendio uh, Bioscience, now a life technologies company. And uh, I'm very excited to share with you uh, uh, some of our work that we've been doing over the past year with TCGA data, and specifically uh, some of our pan cancer analysis of 3,000 exomes. Um, uh, broadly, uh, Compendia's modest mission is to cure cancer with genomics data, and uh, we really try to accomplish that uh, in two ways with our biopharma customers, um, and that is, one, trying to uh, help them uh, get to novel therapeutic targets, and um, following that, trying to really define the right patients uh, uh, that could potentially respond to the treatment um, uh, for these targets. Um, and we do this within the company by tightly working between the bioinformatics and translational medicine teams and also working with our customers to see what their goals are. Um, the general approach that Compendia has taken to, to, to accomplish these goals is to really be the world's uh, repository of, of cancer genome data. And uh, we have about 10 years' experience working with uh, microarray uh, data as well as capillary sequencing data, and we currently have the uh, largest uh, collection of copy number data, which helps us identify uh, uh, amplification and deletion events. Uh, but really, TCGA is critical for our effort to make this catalog complete, right, with the effort and the, the scope of TCGA and the ambition of the data available. Um, uh, we can really expand uh, and look at the long tail of, of these somatic aberrations, which will help us uh, reach our goals. Um, uh, the unique opportunities that TCGA presents for us is the mutation and fusion data that's available from the, uh, from the exome uh, samples that, that, that have been collected. So this is what I'll focus on in my talk. And I'll briefly go through our views of uh, challenges as a company of working with TCGA and the approaches that we take, and then show several examples both from the mutations and the fusions. Um, so first, preaching to the choir, uh, the, the scale uh, of the data is, is challenging. It's rapidly evolving. Um, terabytes of data to process if you look at the exome data with uh, ready to eat up as much compute time as you can throw at it. Uh, heterogeneity, TCG has done a great job, as you've heard uh, all throughout today and yesterday, of compiling the data, getting it into one place and trying to be as consistent as possible. But it's an evolving project. Uh, different working groups still use very slightly different methods, potentially uh, different gene models. Um, so there's uh, still a question of data heterogeneity uh, that you have to address if you want to do a pan-cancer analysis, for example. Uh, as a company, one of our unique requirements is speed. We really want to give our customers a competitive advantage of, of seeing these novel discoveries uh, uh, as soon as possible that are, that are somewhere in this data. So we really value uh, getting the most up-to-date data, processing it, interpreting it, and delivering the results in a timely manner. Uh, and there's also a question of method development. Uh, many of the methods used in the TCJ uh, analyses are still evolving, and that's great, but uh, some of them haven't been published, for example, and so it's, it's, it's uh, to us, uh, uh, the burden in delivering really relevant events is to try to identify true, uh, first identify the true positive events, and then out of those, identify the drivers. Uh, just, just as an example, uh, as, as, as um, Mutech beta testers, uh, uh, we actually ran in on several hundred samples to identify mutations, several hundred TCGA samples, and uh, we knew that it generates a lot of false positives, but since the method hasn't been published yet, it was challenging for us to uh, know exactly which filters have been applied to generate the, the nice curated TCGA data set. Uh, so we, uh, we applied, we developed some of our own quality-based filters and uh, compared the data back to TCGA, and we're happy to find that that our understanding of what quality mutation data is compares to that of TCGA. So uh, both kind of c now have more trust in the TCGA data, but also on our own have uh, a method of calling mutations and producing comparable data sets. Um, so this, this uh, method development process is, is, is a part of our work. Um, so here's the approach for us to, to address these goals. Uh, we used all three data sources extensively for mutations. We use uh, the Broad GDAC and the DCC, depending which one has the most up-to-date data at the time. Uh, we uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, can process our own mutations and fusions, and we get the primary data, of course, from uh, CG Hub for those purposes. Um, 
as uh, CG Hub beta testers, we actually developed quite a robust pipeline to ingest uh, uh, RNA-seq and DNA-seq uh, data and do our own fusion calling. So uh, just as an example, we've, uh, just this summer, we've done um, several thousand uh, calls, several fusion calls and several thousand samples, which is, um, you know, 50 terabytes or so of data and over a year's worth of compute time, and we've managed to do it in about a, a week. Um, so we have this great, uh, great infrastructure set up to uh, process uh, raw data, but also uh, to re-annotate and standardize uh, the mutation data that's already called. Um, so this, this gives us uh, our, our uh, comprehensive uh, kind of somatic aberration database from which we can start doing integrative analysis and pan-cancer analysis and uh, really get to the, this whole driver questions. What are the new and exciting uh, driver events? Um, and our general approach to, to getting at these drivers is to really have a, a kind of this iterative method development uh, process where we look at gold standard positives, so known mutations, uh, known validated mutations, and uh, known published fusions, and uh, try to develop methods uh, that, that uh, call out uh, events of, of similar type in this, from this catalog. So here's a brief overview of our, uh, of our mutations pipeline. This is a snapshot from uh, about middle of this year um, where we've processed, says 3,000, but uh, it's actually 2,998 samples from, uh, from about across 15 diseases. Uh, and we obtained, the, uh, as I said, the, the, the data from, from TCG. Um, a little over a million mutations and goes into our annotation pipeline. Uh, Primary goals of the annotation pipeline uh, is to, to really uh, define a consistent variant classification and variant position for these mutations, since variant position is important for us in looking for occurrence. Um, this is uh, the protein level uh, position of the mutation. Uh, we also filter to kind of gene regions of interest, throwing out a lot of endogenic uh, stuff. Uh, we then uh, are down to, to about 700,000 mutations, and uh, we really classify mutations into three categories. So we call out hotspot mutations. So first, recurrent hotspot mutations are, are those that occur in, in three or more uh, samples in this data set. And it's a very simple definition, but it works remarkably well. Um, and most of these events are statistically significant. So if we see mutation at the same position in three or more uh, samples, it's a hotspot. Uh, we also call out the potential loss of function deleterious mutations, such as frame shifts, non-stops, and such. Um, we then assign statistical significance to the hotspots and uh, the deleterious mutations on the gene level. And uh, our approach is different from um, from uh, MUTSIG, for example. Uh, we use uh, both the, 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 the relative occurrence uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, enrichment of these mutations in the gene, but our approach is really driven towards uh, classification of a gene into uh, two uh, broad categories, a potential gain of function or a potential loss of function gene. And uh, there's more detail on our scheme if you're interested in the poster. Um, uh, and this scheme was, was developed by looking at gold standard oncogenes and tumor suppressors and then really identifying wh what are the characteristics do we see? Do we see a uh, certain percentage of hotspot mutations in those genes, a certain enrichment of deleterious mutations? So out of this uh, 3,000 uh, sample data set, we identified 107 potential gain-of-function genes uh, and about 120 potential loss-of-function genes. This is on a pan-cancer uh, level. There's also a mutation analysis uh, uh, that was done. So I'll highlight two examples. One you might be f uh, very familiar with, and one sort of uh, a novel one that comes out of the pan cancer analysis. So uh, this is one of our predicted gain of function genes, which is good, uh, known oncogene uh, with uh, therapies in the works. 16% um, mutation rate uh, across the, the cancer types. Um, the bar chart here uh, in pink is the frequency of recurrent of these recurrent hotspot mutations, whereas the gray are uh, other mutations that aren't recurrent or deleterious. And so you can see that, that um, it's definitely enriched for hotspot mutations. Uh, deleterious would be in blue and you don't see any. Um, and it's remarkable that 14 out of the 15 cancers, there are at least some pic 3 ca recurrent mutations uh, that we observe. On the bottom is the... Uh, uh, on the x-axis is the, the residue position, and uh, on the y-axis is the, the individual occurrences that we see in this data set uh, colored by disease. So you can see that many of these uh, peaks, uh, many of these are, are known peaks, and they occur across disease types, so it's not a, a many of these are not disease-specific. So um, 
the E545 and the E542 and the H1047 peaks are well known, but um, you can also see that we start seeing some of these smaller but also su perhaps significant driver events such as the E726 uh, peak in the kinase domain, and this is uh, really those events that, that our customers are looking to explore. Are these mutually exclusive? Are there potentially uh, uh, also things to look for or to target in, in, in patients? Um, this is a, a RAF1, which is CRAF, uh, and uh, it actually, uh, much, much less uh, frequency of occurrence, only 1% across the cancer types, um, uh, but we do see it in several cancer types. And uh, the, the fascinating thing about this, uh, this example is that this, uh, this serine in the, in the second conserved domain uh, is actually implicated in, um, in a, in a in an uh, autosomal dominant disorder where it, uh, it's an inhibitor phosphorylation site and when it's disrupted it actually causes uh, RASMAP-K dysregulation and so there's um, developmental aberrations, mental retardation. But this is a somatic example of this event and we wouldn't have called it out if it wasn't for the pan-cancer analysis. So as you can see the colors of the, of the dots in that peak are different. So this is only by combining across disease types can you kind of see these, these events pop pop up and then drill into them to see if they're functionally significant. Um, so I'll move on to our, our fusions method. Um, uh, this is again a snapshot from the summer. We've since done about 3,000 more uh, samples. This is from six diseases. Uh, many of the diseases that we picked were ones where known fusions uh, exist, so we could validate our methods. Um, we implemented two uh, fusion collars, uh, diffuse and top hat. Um, so we have both single and paired in uh, calling capability. Uh, we did find that with default parameters, many of these methods uh, actually miss some of the known fusions because they filter them out. They're a little too aggressive. So we rolled back uh, the filtering and uh, devised our own uh, kind of uh, filtering and classification scheme, filtering mostly for breakpoints in, in, in known gene regions and uh, classifying based on uh, if the fusion was, uh, if the sample was processed by both callers, we'd like to see um, uh, dual caller validation, so both callers calling it, and there's also kind of an evidence-backed uh, uh, scheme to, to, to filter. So uh, we have about 127 priority fusion events in this data set. About half of those are actually known published, uh, uh, published fusions, which is uh, really comforting to us. Um, and of course, the, the rest are, are potential novel discoveries that we hope are exciting for our customers. Uh, so this one uh, was, a, was, a, was a result that we uh, like to see, temper circ fusion mentioned earlier on. We saw it at expected frequency. Uh, 30 out of the 53 uh, uh, prostate samples had it. Uh, expected fusion boundaries, uh, uh, the, the below is our kind of plot of exon count to the five prime and three prime end of the breakpoint, so we're seeing the same isoforms. Um, the really fascinating uh, thing is to look at the expression. Um, this is TCJ expression data. Uh, uh, in pink are fusion positive samples where the fusions were called, and you can see that erg expression is, is up because it's driven by, uh, by tempers. Um, the exon level plot is also pretty, pretty cool, so, so the diamonds are the uh, the predicted breakpoints, and you can really see elevated expression in the fusion positive samples past the breakpoint. Um, there's uh, the blue samples are the ones where the fusion has not been predicted, and you can see the expression is pretty flat. Uh, interestingly, there's a couple of cases which show high expression, and you can see the, the faint blue lines in the exon plot. Um, and uh, these are potentially undercalled samples, so it'll be interesting to go back and see why some of the callers miss those. Um, <laughs> Now, we also looked at individual gene partners and their recurrence, and this is uh, RET, uh, uh, RET fusions, RET partner fusions. Of course, the most dominant event was the RET PTC um, and thyroid. Uh, we found uh, nine, nine of these, uh, but we also found RET fusions in, in breast and, and lung um, with a pretty consistent breakpoint. So these are, uh, these are possible exciting new observations of this fusion and other diseases. Um, Again, looking at the exon level uh, plots, we can see uh, corroborating uh, expression evidence for these, uh, for these fusion events. And once again, we have some events that, are, that may be uh, undercalled. Um, so uh, some future directions for us with TCGA is gonna be an important resource. We're gonna continue to try to 
uh, ingest as much data as we can and, and, and continue to make these, uh, these pan-cancer and really whole-scale uh, calls, digging into the, the tail end of the, of the uh, somatic aberration landscape, so to speak. Uh, we're also moving in the direction of integrative analysis, um, uh, gene pathway level summarization and various outcome and uh, uh, analyses. And, um, trying to get more cancer types beyond TCGA to improve our pan-cancer analysis and uh, uh, potentially mapping the drivers that we find back to model systems for better functional classification or better functional characterization. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we're still a business and we're going to be driven by, by what our customers, uh, 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 what the, our customers' questions are and uh, try to answer those as best as we can. I'd like to thank everybody at Compendia. Uh, we have a, a small but great team who made this, uh, made, make this possible. Um, uh, we also like to thank all of you. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible with whole, without the whole of TCGA, but specifically uh, Kenneth Shaw, Michael Noble, and Christian, um, as well as the CG Hub uh, guys, Mark Deakins and Chris Wilkins, and, and Daewon Kim for feedback with Top Hat. Thank you very much. Thank you.